Ladies and gentlemen, there is a question which I want to ask you guys. How did William Samuel Araproto manage to outwit a combined force of President Ruru Kenyatta and Raila Amolo Odinga? How did he manage to do it? Because the truth of the matter is that William Ruto went into this election as an outsider after the handshake. Raila Odinga went into the election as an insider. And Raila Odinga supporters believed very strongly that Raila Odinga was going to win the election because now he had the support of the system. Number two, William Ruto was also facing a combined force of dynasties. Uhuru Kenyatta, Raila Odinga, and Gideon Moy. These three people were on one side. William Ruto still managed to outwit them. Again, William Ruto entered this election solo. As a matter of fact, at some point during the campaign, William Ruto was alone. Raila Odinga, Wetangula, Kalonzo, Ruto, I mean Kalonzo, uh, Gideon, Uhuru, and the entire group were on one side. But William Ruto still managed to even outwit them during the building bridges initiative process. How did William Ruto manage to achieve that? In this video, I want us to I want to explain to you guys how he managed it. Before we do that, in case you are watching the channel for the first time, please take a second or two, click that subscribe button so that next time we produce a video like this, YouTube will automatically notify you. And to the subscribers, I want to continue thanking you guys for your continued support because without that support, this channel cannot be where it is. So please, I want to make a request to you guys, give this particular video thumbs up. Let me make a confession. Personally, I never thought that Ruto would be able to defeat a combined force of Raila and Uhuru. I never imagined. But he managed to do it. Why? Number one is the early campaigns. One thing most people did not realize was the fact that William Ruto was focused on the presidency as early as 2013. So when they won 2013 and 2017, he already planned how he was going to win the presidency. So he had a singular focus, the presidency. But for Raila Odinga and Uru Kenyatta, they believed that there was no way, for example, William Ruto was going to sustain early campaigns for five good years. In fact, even myself, I never imagined that William Ruto could sustain the campaigns, especially after the handshake. So Uru Kenyatta tried everything. Kick out his allies from government, you know. People who were believed to be giving him money from parastatals were kicked out. All sources of resources were stopped. But William Ruto surged on because he realized that he needed money for the campaigns. William Ruto made money is the moment they got in government in 2013. So by 2017, when we were going for the second term, when they were going for second term, he already had the money for the campaign. So he could sustain, in his own estimation, he could sustain that campaign. I was talking earlier on to one of his close allies. By that time, he was a good friend of mine. And he was telling me that most people believe that Ruto was not going to sustain the campaigns. But according to William Ruto, what he told them, he was prepared and was not even using much. According to them, William Ruto like, would uh, organize meetings in Karen, delegations, you know, those are funded by states. They will come. Then he would uh, attend a church service in, uh, where, in Mount Kenya, where he would dish out, like, every week he would spend, like, maybe 10 million. So he had figured out that he would be able to sustain that. Raila and, Ruto, and Uhuru believed there was no way he was going to sustain. So that early campaign is what projected William Ruto ahead of the pack. And because he was the only person running, every opinion poll started showing William Ruto ahead. And because he's a populist politician, he, start, he started attracting huge, huge rallies. And by the time these guys realized, it was late. Number two is messaging. And William Ruto will have to thank Mutai Nguni, 
who coined for him the hustler narrative. If you look at Red Odinga's campaign, if you look at Red Odinga's campaign, there was no clear messaging. For William Ruto, it was clear the hustler narrative. Mutuachini. I'm coming as one of you. I'm coming to target you this time around. The government will be yours. So that message resonated with so many people. And then he created a class war. The hustlers and the dynasties. So that anybody who had the money was viewed as a hustler. I mean, as a dynasty. And every person who was struggling to put food on the table was a hustler. So the hustler narrative was cutting across. And that's how William Ruto was then able to break that chain of uh, tribal dominance. Because initially, and this is where Aurelio Dinga made a mistake. Initially, and I advised them, the only way which they would have used to counter the hustler narrative was the tribal dominance. Relo Dinga ought to have come out very strongly on tribal dominance so that people like Babo Wino, people <coughs> who could speak, would actually go outside there and tell the country that the country cannot be ruled by two tribes forever. So it, it was 60 years. Now I'm, I'm sure it's going to go up to 70 years because after Ruto, I can assure you, Rigadi Gashago is likely to become the next president. So that tribal dominance it what, it's what could have managed to break the hustler narrative. So by the time they realized it was late, Uhuru Kenyatta came up with the tribal dominance, but they chickened out again. But that was the only solution. So William Ruto had a clear campaign messaging, the hustler narrative. Once he brought on board Muslim Davadi, who is part of the dynasty, he had to drop that. And he came up with the bottoms up. Basically meaning, what wachini kukuja, kukuja ju. So he had a clear messaging. For Elo Dinga, up to this stage, I don't know what their message for this particular campaign was. At one point, when I asked, they told me that the, the messaging is devolved, like per region. So each region, whenever they go, they, they had a message for them. But for Ruto, you could pick out their messaging. Number three, in my view, <laughs> William Ruto was willing to accommodate. He was willing to reach out to anybody and everybody. As a matter of fact, the collapse of NASA, which personally I strongly believed was engineered by Ruto, was a blessing to him. Relo Dinga fell for the trap and disbanded NASA immediately after the handshake. You know, power is always sweet. He wanted to be around the president alone. So, William Ruto reached out to everybody. Who would have imagined that today Meguna Meguna would be singing praises of William Ruto? While it's a known fact that Ruto was the one guy who engineered his king kicking out of the country. It is a known fact that people like, like Kipchumba Murkomen actually celebrated when Meguna Meguna was kicked out of the country. So William Ruto reached out to Meguna Meguna because he knew that with someone like Meguna Meguna attacking him online, there was a way he was going to persuade people. In this country today, William Ruto is working with the people nobody would have imagined would have actually worked with him. For example, Eliud Owalo is my good friend. Nobody would have imagined that Eliud Owalo would uh, work with Ruto. When uh, William Ruto tried to grab the Langata Primary School land, I was with Owalo when he was climbing that wall, for those who can remember those photos. And Owalo was one of the people who you would never... Mention Ruto in good light, uh, good light uh, I mean, in good light around him. So William Ruto is today working with Elio Duvalo. He's working with Hassan Omar of all the people. So basically William Ruto was able to work with anybody because he knew what he wanted. On the other side, Raila Odinga and the team were not willing to work with anybody and everybody. They were not. Most people don't know on this channel that some people tagged me on this channel. Where, 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 that's why sometimes I laugh. I laugh when people say that... Uh, I was advocating for Ruto as, as in I was paid by Raila. There are so many people who believed that for me, I was, I was um, supporting Ruto. You know, around Raila Odinga. So they, they didn't want me around Raila Odinga because initially Raila Odinga would call me. But there are people who didn't want that. So at some point, even some men in black 
was sent to me most people don't know this so for ruto he was accommodating everybody like if I'd heeded to the pressure from his team who really wanted me i would be working for ruto ruto was willing to work with everybody for ilo dinga no way they had to choose either you are close to wini or you are blah blah things like those number four Say number four, number five. I don't know. I'm getting confused. Number four. I mean, number five. I think number four. Sorry. I don't know whether I'm, these things are one, two, three, four. It's jubilee failures. Jubilee failures. William Ruto managed after the handshake to run away from jubilee failures. You know, in 2013 and 2017. That is when Kenya found itself in debt. Corruption was the order of the day. By the time Kenyans were going for elections in 2017, Jubilee government had failed. In fact, they had achieved nothing. You... And because of propaganda, they created a portal where they were showing what Jubilee had achieved. And that portal had just fake things. But for the elections, they managed to win. So immediately after that election, those who were in Jubilee started realizing that indeed this government failed and William Ruto because of the handshake was able to exonerate himself from those failures Relo Dinga had to carry the burden of jubilee failures how William Ruto managed to escape jubilee failures and hand them over to Relo Dinga is something which still I can't understand and Relo Dinga was in a fix there was no way he would try to escape jubilee failures without attacking president Uhuru Kenyatta so he was there while William Ruto was heaping blames on him <laughs> and that's that's it number 5 is what i call mount kenya factor do you know why Raila Odinga collapsed nasa because Raila Odinga looked at himself as someone who had uh, the support of course he has and then he looked at Uhuru who was his opponent in 2017 and figured out that as much as Uhuru and Ruto are now falling out Ruto will go with the Kalenjin, Uhuru with the, will remain with the Kikuyus. Ruto had a different idea. That for him to succeed, he needed to consolidate the mountain. So Uhuru Kenyatta failed to counter William Ruto in Mount Kenya. And that's why Raila Odinga failed. Sorry, something choked me a bit. That's why Raila Odinga failed. Mount Kenya is what complicated the equation for Raila Odinga. As much as Raila Odinga managed to get over 1. Point something million votes from the mountain, William Ruto still dominated the mountain. If Uhuru Kenyatta had just pushed the figure a bit, I don't think we will be talking of Ruto today. Because as as, as long as William Ruto would not be able to control Mount Kenya Raila would be the president although the difference was 230 and most people are arguing that Raila Odinga ought to have consolidated the Nyanza where around 700,000 votes voters Luo Nyanza 700,000 voters did not turn up to vote but again William Ruto still managed to control Mount Kenya and Raila Odinga was banking fully on Mount Kenya so the fact that William Ruto understood the importance of Mount Kenya and stuck with it and showed Uhuru Kenyatta did not make inroads there is the reason he became the president <laughs> Number 6 is IEBC. The truth of the matter is that IEBC elected the fifth president of the Republic of Kenya for Kenyans. There are certain moves which IEBC made with the blessings of William Ruto and with his planning. How could Wafula Chebukati print Form 34A, Book 2 of 2, when it was not necessary. How could he do that? At the same time, Form 34B, <laughs> he did not print. You know, you order a printer to print for you a form at taxpayer's cost. Then, expressively, then they print two copies. That copy is what was used to rig this election. And remember, IBC had beef with Raila. 
Someone was telling me that when Ra- when Fulach Bukati reached out to Rafael Tojo so that they could enter some negotiations with Raylo Dinga, he was dismissed. Raylo Dinga dismissed him. That for him, he believes in fairness. There is no fairness in elections. So IBC worked for Roto. How Raylo Dinga entered into this election with Fulach Bukati? How Raylo Dinga entered into this election with 19 returning officers from the Kalenjin nation out of 42 is something which for me I mean that's something which for me I can't really understand number seven is the deep state Relu Dinga had banked all his hopes on the deep state that he had the people the only thing he's been missing is the deep state unknown to Relu Dinga or maybe known to him but he ignored was the fact that the deep state was divided the Uhuru Kenyatta's deep state was divided. Relo Dinga ought to have listened to this analysis which I normally give here. The deep state was divided into four. There was the part of the deep state which believed that Uhuru Kenyatta ought to have supported William Samuel Arab Ruto because they worked together with Ruto. They know Ruto what he can do, what he cannot do. There's another part of the deep state which believed that the next president ought to have come from among themselves. They wanted Matiangi and they wanted Mutai Kagwe as a pair. There was the third part of the deep state which wanted a compromise candidate. That compromise candidate was Musalia Mudavadi. That part of the deep state is the one which delivered Mudavadi to Ruto. And then there was the last deep state led by Uhuru, which believed that the candidate was Raila Odinga because he had the support, he only needed that deep state. So they never managed to bring this deep state together. Uhuru Kenyatta remained with only one deep state, the one which believed in Raila Odinga. The other ones went with Ruto. Those are the people who manipulated Raila Odinga. They are the people who manipulated the system. I've read an article by Boniface Mwangi how Raila Odinga was being played by NIS being given fake figures on the election day and he was sure Raila Odinga and Martha Karo, and they were sure that they were winning the elections. So the deep state failed Raila Odinga because William Ruto understood the game. He managed to bring some of the deep state to his side. There are certain things which are happening in this country which could not have happened if Ruto did not manage to have a bit of the deep state. Number eight is the judiciary. <laughs> you know, if you read or if you listen to the Supreme Court judgment, <laughs> okay, let's not venture there. But the truth of the matter is that the judiciary annulled the 2017 election. Ray Lodinga never participated in that election. They felt that Red Udinga disrespected them. They felt that they risked their lives. People like Philomena Muilu believed very strongly that they were being targeted. Even the driver was eliminated in this country. They were waiting for Red Udinga to go to Supreme Court again. And the moment Red Udinga took himself to Supreme Court, they had the opportunity. I'm told Jokindungu and Philomena Muilu were bitter with President Rukenyata and Red Udinga. That despite the hardship, they were never elevated. Philomena Mwili wanted to be the chief justice. Njoki Dungu wanted to be the deputy chief justice. They were ignored and Martha Kome was brought on board. Martha Kome buried Raila Amolo Odinga. And lastly is the politics of money. William Ruto understood Kenyan politics. He was with Moi. He understood why Moi stayed in power. William Ruto was with Raila Odinga. He understood that Raila Odinga is not good at using money. He was with Uru Kenyatta. He understood the power of money. And William Ruto targeted the Kikuyus and the poor. You only need money to convince a Kikuyu to support you. That's according to Ruto's philosophy. And he managed to do that. For the other poor Kenyans, he promised them. He made promises to them. I'm going to reduce for you the cost of hunger. I'm going, the cost of fuel is high because of Uhuru Kenyatta. Electricity 
costs are high because the Kenyatta family are controlling Kenya power. While in real sense, Ndindi Nyoro is the one controlling Kenya power. So with those, William Ruto was able. And lastly, he added the church. Opium for the poor. You know, Kenyans always go to church for spiritual nourishment. Church provided opportunity for Ruto in the mountain and in the rest of the republic. And Ray Lodinga kept on making mistakes with the church. So the church was with Ruto. And they were able to persuade their members to support Ruto. Someone was on, on my live show yesterday. And he asked me about the Akurino. Because Uru Kenyatta went to Akurino, gave 10 million. Ray Lodinga never gave any money. He was like, if Uru was truly supporting Raila, why could he give 5 million himself? And 5 million for Raila Amolodinga. But the church also contributed. I don't know what you think. But at, to some extent, we have also external factor. The international community. Why America hates Raila Amolodinga. Next.